So hi, Dan. Uh, great to have you with us uh, to talk about generative AI. How are you doing? Uh, doing well. Nice That's to be nice. here. Fantastic. And obviously, you're going to be giving a keynote at Legal Innovators California in June, which we're very excited about. Uh, but before then, I thought it'd be good to ask you a few quick fire questions, uh, and then we'll get into some of the deeper stuff. So uh, first of all, um, do you really think that generative AI is going to completely change the legal world? Well, I don't know, completely change, but I do think that there's a bunch of use cases and, and opportunities to invoke generative AI and other kind of related uh, technologies uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 yeah, to materially impact our, our sector. Um, I don't think it'll be unrecognizable. I think maybe the percentage of tasks being done by machines versus humans will tilt in favor of machines. But I do think then the possibility is when you make something much cheaper, then the question is, what can you also do with with these kind of technologies that you would just say, you know, that's too cost prohibitive. Historically, we would never do that. Um, so it, it's hard to sort of say, well, it's the net impact because, you know, there's there's two ledger entries, the positive and the negative, so to speak. So is it is it the case that now that the AI can actually do what everyone expected it to do? And secondly, for the end user, it's going to become incredibly cheap. Yeah, I, I think it can do, it has a lot more capability. You probably should still have a human in the loop for oversight purposes, but it's, you know, it's a far different thing to oversee something than to do it from first principles. And so I, I mean, I think in terms of like, well, how many units of time does it take to produce X, Y, Z thing? You know, we're, we're, we're slanting in the direction of, of uh, kind of, you know, machine enablement. I, I think the one missing question is, what about all the internal information that sits inside of organizations? And that is still a fairly open question. I mean, a lot of these tools are trained on the general internet and other types of like corporate, but not, you know, to really connect the dots, it's like we have all this information sitting in organizations and we got to unlock that. That's where it's going to get really interesting. Absolutely. We'll come to that in a second. Um, do you think that this is effectively the end of an era for legal tech and the beginning of a new one? Yes. Yeah, as, yes. You know, the, the end of the typewriter was the end of sort of manually producing contracts in a sort of very, very simplistic way. Yeah. I mean, if we went back, say, 10 years coming out of the financial crisis, that that was a kind of era all the way up to into COVID or whatever. And that, that was a that was a window of time. And that was normalizing a lot of these ideas in organizations. If you went back 10 years, you know, the legal tech was a very kind of on the outside looking in, and now it's a you know more materially involved in, in the sector. And so I think now we're tra transitioning into kind of a new a new period. And I, I think kind of a lot of the legacy technology providers have to think about, well, what does this all mean? And I think they're sort of sussing it out. They're all going to start with thinking they can do it all by themselves. But I think what will happen over time is they'll realize we need help with this. We're going to have to, then, and that's going to lead to a whole new round of M&A activity would be my, my, my bet over the next 12 to 24 months. Interesting. And, and do you think we will actually see job losses? You know, the old, um, you know, I mean, I've often poked at it a few times, the idea of the end of lawyers, because when you saw natural language processing come along, it did look like something was going to happen. And, it, and many things have happened and it's been integrated into all different types of technology from Westlaw to a whole bunch of things. And it's actually much more prevalent than people expected. However, no one has lost their job because of it. But this time around, is it going to be different? Well, I think if people say, I have to do this exact task in this exact way for the rest of time, okay, now that's probably not going to hold out. But again, two side, two ledger entries, what is, what is you know, being enabled by machines, you know, what, what's, what is it a machine can do as well or better than a person, or at least with a tiny bit of oversight, but what is also being made possible by the fact that basically the generation of text is going to get, is already being made quite, quite cheap by historical perspective. And so... That means reviewing lots of text and or producing lots of text. And so, so that's so, that that people just don't do stuff that they could theoretically do if stuff were if, if text was cheap to produce or to consume. Um, but does that mean that uh, for law firms uh, that they will be disincentivized from using this technology for the obvious reasons? And we can get into that into more detail uh, in the second half of this. But, you know, the biddable hour, time is money and so forth. Or, or just or something much, much more prosaic, which is this is how we do things. You know, we've been doing this for about 100 years. Uh, we do it very well. We get paid very well. The clients are pretty happy. 
and you're saying we're going to do this thing now that changes everything? Well, I, I guess uh, law firms have been losing market share for a long time, actually, if you look at the total number of legal tasks being conducted. Uh, the growth of in-house the in-house function and the number of FTEs working in companies is there's still a bunch of tasks being done. They just never make it outside of the building. Uh, and so in that sense, that that's already, that's been the dynamic that's been playing out over the last one to two decades. Uh, so that I just say that kind of at the outset, uh, the secondary kind of, you know, question is, you know, law firms are very resilient and able to kind of create opportunities to, you know, take their expertise and, and solve people's problems. And, uh, uh, I mean, I wouldn't bet against them uh, uh, in, in the sense now, what is every person doing every day in what is the kind of machine versus person kind of distribution that I mean, that people can adapt to that. I, I don't I don't see uh, uh, and some firms will do it better than others. If they had slightly fewer associates and more tool like tools and machines or they had more of this and less of that i mean it it's just a different portfolio but it's still an organization that can you know go forward it, it it seems to me i mean the big dynamic for me has always been legal complexity just keeps moving up into the right that's the supply that's the problems to be solved and as that continues to i mean that's been a big focus of my academic work it's just documenting this growth of legal complexity so if that keeps moving up into the right there's a lot of work to be done and i think there's still plenty for law firms to work on they mm -hmm. just might not do all as much of the routine stuff, but they were already getting kind of squeezed out of that anyway by a range of things, in-house, ALSPs, tools, what have you. And in okay. fact, you, you, you could argue that actually this has come at the nick of time because really, as you were saying, the complexity is so great, the volume is so great, the global nature of this is so great and adds to the complexity and volume that, you know, something has got to give. You, you simply... Yeah. Rather than the same way that e-discovery came in at a period when the quantity of data going into a piece of litigation was, yeah. you know, going out exponentially, yeah. something had to give. And perhaps this is this, you know, it's almost it was going to happen anyway at some point. Yeah, I, I, I view it sort of like that, which is to say, you know, you're right. I mean, e-discovery, well, our proliferation of electronic data broke the historic economic model so that it was like not even plausible to, to, to not use machines. Mach are, are using our devices and all the emails and all the electronic communications, which was a, just, you know, function of normal life and business, everyday life and everyday business just sort of broke the, the logic of eyes on review of every document. I mean, that just, I mean, that went the way of the world because it just wasn't even feasible. And I think this complexity account, if you sort of even half believe some of the work that we've done, it's it's sort of up and to the right in every, every way you can measure it 20 different ways, but they always, it's always kind of up into, you know, it just heads on up. And so that means there's work to be done that has to, you know, if, if an organization is going to even remotely try to follow the law, then they have to dedicate time and, re, you know, resources to the tasks that are created by all the regulatory complexity. And so machines have got to be part of that story. It's just, Absolutely. you know. Um, yeah. last, last quick question, and then we'll get into some of the deeper, deeper analysis. I mean, do you think we'll ever actually get to an artificial lawyer? Uh, you know, which obviously my magazine is named after the, you know, this particularly talking about agents that can teach themselves that can improve mm -hmm. upon, upon tasks and find the best strategies rather like a human would. And we can get to a point, I don't know, five, 10, 20 years, who knows where, where literally, you know, you've got a lawyer, you genuinely have a lawyer in a box and it is that smart. It is that uh, creative. It is that ingenious in a sort of machine learning way that you really can, aside from really, really mega complicated, strange tasks, it can pretty much handle it. Well, I think this is just a special version of the broader question of AGI, you know, in a sense. I mean, people were wondering, you know, well, one of the questions is how would we even know we had AGI? That's like people debate that in the academic community and, and just sort of more broadly is, you know, what would be the indicias? I mean, historically, we had this idea of the Turing test, which in a sense is kind of was it was never a strict test. It was kind of a thought experiment. And so, you know, what I guess what you what I would say to kind of fill in that question a bit is like, well, what would we be what would be evidence of that? Um, well, first, can it do legal tasks kind of discreetly? Can it toggle between those tasks? Can it do something creative or emergent that wasn't kind of strictly, here's the input data and here's some output data that it kind of, I mean, that's that we're already observing. And then there's this question right now, 
you know, a, a pretty strong debate in the academic community is, is there emergence in these models, meaning um, the outputs can't be really traced directly back to the inputs. Well, exactly. I mean, that, that's, I mean, just to round off before we get into analysis, I mean, for me, you know, even though things have clearly improved since GPT-3 and 3.5 and some other models, there is still a feeling that we're, we're basically in a land of regurgitation, you know, very sophisticated regurgitation, but it's regurgitation. Yeah. Uh, and the creativity is, is in, in place is almost, is almost surreal, but we don't, I, but how long before we just get to that truly measured intelligent creativity? Like, well, I mean, there is a paper by Microsoft research called sparks of AGI and they're trying to say, well, here's some tasks that kind of, it's hard to explain how, unless there's what they would call an intermediate representation being created, meaning you have inputs and some representation or shortcut as being developed within this neural net that allows you to shortcut the problem. Uh, it's hard to explain how you can get these outputs from those inputs. And so similarly for us, it would be, hey, here's some problem in our domain. And, and, and again, this is all like GPT-4 has been out for like five weeks. Uh, so it's not like everybody's had a chance to, I mean, we did this paper on the bar exam and I see stuff in there and I think, well, that's particularly um, the one part of the bar exam that focuses on what the what it's called the MPT in the American bar exam, but it's it's this practical lawyering exercise that you're that they added to the bar to make it more realistic. And so here you have a person doing a task that was sort of like what a lawyer would do, where you give a person a case file and they have to analyze that and then draft the documents in light of that. I mean, I that starts to look like more in that kind of direction, at least I'd say, than you know simply you know could you sort of statistically infer that the answer is C to some multiple choice question, which, you know, again, is impressive in its own right, but it's, I think the MPT part in particular impressed me the most, frankly, um, from our work on the bar exam. No, uh, no, absolutely. And just last sort of relatively quick question, which is, I mean, would you say that this is, at least in your career, and you, you know, you've been immersed in technology for many years, is this the biggest thing that's ever happened in your, in your experience? Yeah, this is the biggest thing. This is definitely the biggest thing. I, I, in the sense that language has always been the hardest problem in AI or one of the hardest problems. And language is so central to the field of law yeah. that that's why we've always been on the outside looking in. And, and it's not that AI hasn't been important and done things in this space, and it certainly has, but no technology developed to date or you know, till, till very, very, very recently was ever really able to have a deep account of, of legal language. It was a lot of the tricks and stuff like this that people did, um, but never a kind of a frontal assault on on language and particularly legal language, which is obviously, you know, most people would say quite a bit more complicated than normal language. And and now we're seeing that. And so that's a big that's a huge deal for our field in probably ways that's unique to our field, because I it's kind of hard to think of a field that's more language centric than law. I mean, I don't know, literature, if you're a literature yeah, professor, well, I, I mean, me, I don't know, but like, course, you know, they're in a whole me, lot. For me as a, as a writer, both right. uh, of, of fiction right. and, and journalism. And, yeah, yeah, but I mean, they, they, we're up there, right? What do you say? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're up there in terms of like language centric kind of fields where other fields really aren't. I mean, language is important. And it's part of it, but it's not like the core. Mm -hmm. It's the core of law. Language is the core of law.